afternoon, and welcome to Sidekick TV, Jeff and the Rabbi. A lot of stuff going on in the world today, so we're going to be very, with our topic today, I think we're going to be very discussing what's going on out there. Mm -hmm. Here's the situation. You know, we're talking about there can never be peace in the Middle East. That's the topic today. And I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm wrong all the time. You know, here I, all the time I've been going out thinking it's the Arabs' fault, the Jews just want to live there. But after the last couple of weeks, I've been told by a lot of my uh, cousins from the up north part of their country here, the liberal area, <clears throat> that I'm wrong. That I have to be wrong in my political views. I have to be wrong in my views of Israel because I'm in the minority. If the majority says something else, then maybe the majority is right. And maybe I'm just, you know, maybe I'm being a little stubborn and I'm wrong. I mean, Israel has a nice country here, but let's put it this way. Since World War II, we created the United Nations. Organizations are supposed to be out there to stop rogue nations and rogue leaders from coming up, and there's been a lot of them since then. We've had, like, Khmer Rouge, we've had Uganda with Idi Amin, we've had Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Syria, all these places killing their people. But in the creation of the UN, one country has got more negative resolutions written against it than all these other horrible rogue nations combined, and that's the Jews in Israel. Right. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Israel's the problem. Jews want to have a little country here. Everybody in the whole world agrees it's their fault. Problems right. in the Middle East are their fault. I mean, you know, give away some land. You got going to give a land to them. So they gave the they gave the Sinai away. That didn't really help. They gave Gaza, Gush Katif, great places of launching rockets. Now didn't right. help. They need to give more. In fact, even our own country, our president of the United States, now our policy is that Israel needs to go back to the 67 borders. You know, where they'll give uh, they'll give the Golan Heights to the Syrians. They'll give, I'm not really sure who they're going to give Jerusalem to, because it was the Jordanians, but just let's give them to some Arabs. We'll, right. give, we'll give Jerusalem to some Arabs. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's the solution. The solution is those pesky Jews just want to have a homeland. If well, they would just give it up, everybody would be happy in the Middle East. You know, you mentioned it, genocide. Let's think about that for a minute. I mean, even the most wild genocide supporter, or so when the claims of genocide cannot point to like piles and piles of bodies and masses of people killed. You don't watch CNN? Uh, no, <laughs> okay. I really don't. <laughs> as a matter of I don't either, but I've heard. But you know, right. in Rwanda, we saw masses of people being killed. There's been a number of places around the world where there were masses of people being killed. In Israel, you know, they don't talk about that because there aren't any. There right. aren't any. As a matter of fact, I heard a um, I heard a, a Palestinian denouncing Israel. Now, he was in Berkeley, right. and he was speaking against Israel. Now, the interesting question is, how did he get to Berkeley if he's a Palestinian? That's a, it's a long way. <laughs> hey, you know how he got there? Well, he went to the border with Israel, and they let him cross. And That's a good point. He yeah. bought an airline ticket, and he went to the airport. You mean he didn't fly out of Gaza International? Right, didn't fly out of GIA? No, he didn't fly out of GIA Airport. He flew out of uh, flew out of, of, of Tel Aviv Ben Gurion Airport. Because wow. he bought a ticket. Probably like, on El Al, too. <laughs> yeah, because he comes and he goes. And as a matter of fact, if you even look at it right now, you can go to Israeli hospitals, and all the Israeli hospitals are treating all the victims from Gaza, because where do they go for hospital attention? They come to Israel. Basically, this genocide is not a genocide at all, not even close. Even by the most wild claims, there are no masses of bodies. No. There are no masses of people. There are, and what are, they, what are they screaming for? They're not screaming we don't want genocide. They want to open the ports in Gaza so that they, because Israel's got it blockaded right now, so that they can import anything they want without um, any Israel oversight. Are you thinking, are you, are you being suspicious and thinking they don't want just food coming <laughs> into that port? Right, um, right. You know, more, uh, more Cheerios, you know? They, yeah, that's, that's, it's so maybe, yeah, maybe it'll be a problem. Yeah, you know, I've heard like Israel's bombing the tunnels where they're sneaking in their weapons on horrible things like that. I do worry about that because they took a lot of time to build those tunnels. So then what's really the deal? So how come, like you said, how come Israel gets tagged for all these horrible things when it is clear that it is categorically different? Also, when it is clear that no country would ever put up with anyone shooting missiles across the border into that country. Daily, almost. Right. I mean, yeah, that's, that's a little you odd. You know, in Syria, a couple of missiles went into Turkey. 
And Turkey said, basically, stop it or you get a war on your hands tomorrow. Now, there was a couple of missiles across the border into refugee camps that really contained the people that were just running away from right. Syria. Right. So, you know, I understand like what the Syrians were after. They're not really declaring war on Turkey. And yet, Turkey said, your missiles cross the border. We're going to war with you if you don't straighten that out now. So you're thinking then, if Canada started sending missiles into uh, north of, you know, northern United States, we probably would be upset about it. Right. Hmm. So, how come yeah. everything's different? Yeah. So the answer to your relatives yes. is that the majority of people do see it differently than them. Who are the majority of people? The majority of people in the world. I can't say the majority of people in the world because I'm not really sure where the Chinese stand on That's this. That's true. They probably you know? And if you don't know where the Chinese stand right. on something, then you don't know anything. It's probably not on the top of their list. But okay. Right. I, and I don't know. You know, I don't know what's going on in Chinese. Right. So once you get to the Chinese, you have to take them out of the equation. They are the majority of the world. But aside from that, there are two generally divergent views as to how to look at current events. And particularly some of these current events, like the Middle East, right. number one. And that is the way of the secularist who views it as a struggle between nations right. with some basic assumptions. Everyone wants to be free, everyone wants their homeland, and everyone wants to pursue life, liberty, happiness, and pursuit of justice, and all this type of stuff. Right. Whether they do or they right. don't. But everyone assumes that. And that freedom is really the number one thing, and I want to be free, I want to live under my own flag. Rights of self-determination is the number one most important thing. That's a certain group of people. Then there's another group of people. And those group of people would contain Jews who believe in the Torah, Christians who believe in the Bible, right. and Muslims who believe in the Koran. And all of those people that are, have a religious orientation to life, they see something else entirely going on in the Middle East, right. and perhaps even in the world. And if you look at the Torah, which is the one I look at, haven't spent too much time on the Koran recently. Yeah. And it's been a while since I've been in a motel, so I haven't seen the New Testament. Right. Right. You know? But um, if you look at the Torah, you see that, there, that it's a story. It's very interesting. You have this story, Adam and Eve. Then there's the flood in Noah. And then Noah has these three sons, one of whom has a descendant called Abraham. Then Abraham has Isaac, and Isaac has Jacob, and that's the book of Genesis. Right. Now, along the way, interestingly enough, Abraham has Ishmael and Isaac. Jacob has Esau. I'm sorry, Isaac has Esau and Jacob, twins. Right, right. Okay? And the stories of the issues that confront Ishmael versus Isaac, Esau versus Jacob, occupy a lot of the book of Genesis. These right. are the two big nemeses of Israel, Esau right. and Ishmael. Now, I don't want to start getting too much into this and start calling it, you know, this group is this and that group is that. No. All I can say is, the question is always asked, why? Like, you could even ask, why the book of Genesis? Like, why do we need to hear all these stories? Well, that's good. I mean, I, I guess by the name, it's the genesis of where we come from, and it's pretty much explaining okay. our, our forefathers. Right. right. And why do we have to hear about this Ishmael son and what happened to him? We heard the about that old story read in the last couple of weeks. And now the Esau story, which is the Torah is really concerned with right, right now. What do we need them for? What do we need to know about them for? And really, the answer is because they represent something in this world. Hmm. Now, maybe the Koran reader might ascribe different representations. Right, right. But they represent something. But they're something. talking about the same guy. Same <laughs> guy. Right. They might say he represents something different that I'm going to say he represents. But everyone agrees he represents. Everyone agrees Ishmael had a brother, and his brother was Isaac. Everyone agrees that there's Isaac and Ishmael. 
And right. everyone agrees that they're not getting along. Right. And everyone agrees that they represent different things. Now, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? Okay, I understand. We got Isaac the good guy, Ishmael the bad guy. But everyone agrees that they are at odds with each other by their very essence. And that that is what life is all about. Good versus evil. That the, the, the Torah, the vision of a Bible student, the vision of a Bible student is that, and I'm talking about right. Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. Right. The basic vision of a Bible student is that there's good and there's evil in the world. And it's the job of good to vanquish evil. Right, right. And therefore, it's not just like, can't we all live together? And if we give enough aid and enough schools, right. everyone will come to be wiser and better and we'll all work together and we'll all, you know, hold hands and dance the Hora right. singing like Muslim words or something like that. It would work that way. Okay, yeah, that, that's true. Because everyone understands that different societies, all Bible adherents uh -huh. understand, that different societies represent different essences and there's a clash. And sometimes it is important for, it's not just good enough for good to mollify or to neutralize evil. It is important for good to vanquish evil. This is why in the Torah it says that if you have an evil person, they have to be put to death. Let's say you have an evil person. Death penalty. The death right. penalty from a biblical perspective is a healthy thing because it's important for a society to identify the bad guy right. and say we repudiate this, you must be liquidated, destroyed, and we're going to hang you or electrocute you or whatever. And that's the way it is with societies also. Well, let me ask you a question then, because in the Torah, I know it, it specifically talks about that, that, that Jacob will continually struggle with Esau, but does it talk about that Isaac will continually struggle with Ishmael? Well, okay, that's an interesting thing. You see, Ultimately, the downfall of Yishmael is very important. There can perhaps be a reconciliation. This is identified in the Torah by the story of the burial of Abraham, father of Yishmael and Isaac. It says at the funeral that he was buried by Isaac and Yishmael. Right. And our sages say, note, Yishmael deferred to Isaac at the funeral. Which means that ultimately there can be a reconciliation. Now, of course, the reconciliation doesn't mean an acceptance of the two as equals. Right, okay. Or of Isaac as accepting Yishmael as the elder brother. But the Yishmael defers to Isaac. So either Yishmael is going to be defeated by Isaac or defer to Isaac if Yishmael is willing to take a secondary role to Isaac, then it can work out. I understand. When it comes to Esau, no. The two are pitted against each other and ultimately the only way that Jacob can move forward is through the annihilation of, Isaac, of, of Esau. The Esau idea has to be wiped out of the world, otherwise there can be no Jacob. Uh, I understand that. Interesting. Now, a good question for you is now, uh, I am assuming that in the Quran, they don't represent it the same way you just said. No. No? No, as a matter of fact, I just heard that they had a holiday not so long ago, and, you know, like when I get done, when I master all of Judaism, right. You're close. Talmud, You're close. then I'm going to start look, looking right. into Islam. So, right. you know, no one, let no one take anything I say about Islam as a definitive word. Right. But I heard that they did just have a holiday that they celebrated, which celebrates the binding of Ishmael. That Abraham's offering of Ishmael. Oh wow! On the uh, uh, I didn't know. I didn't know they, I didn't think nobody believed yeah, that. Yeah, I think that they had a holiday to that extent. Wow. Okay. That's what I heard. I, I didn't check that. it out. I'm not sure exactly what they did. I don't know.
I heard it was a little bit different. It was binding, but they supposed they were going to blow them up. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little right. bit different. I think I something know. about, like, you know, they uh, they roast a lamb and then they shoot machine guns in the air or something. That, I could, be, that could be any Friday. But yeah. so. <laughs> don't know exactly how that goes. Okay. So, y y so your point is that you think then, and what you're saying is based on what we read in the Torah, there is not going to be peace. Or there could be, but it's not the peace that, that, you know, where everybody is equal and loving. Right. And it well, really right. can't, there cannot be a peaceful accommodation. There can't be a peaceful accommodation. Now, as far as, and, and I don't want to say, you know, who is who. Just because someone's an Arab doesn't mean they're descended of Ishmael. Right. It is quite possible. For example, you know, it says that Esav married Ishmael's daughter. So you right. see that there's a lot of mix between these two. And I'm not going to start saying who Hamas is, right. and who, you know, who the PLO is, and all this type of stuff. All I'm saying is that we view the story of the struggle of nations as part of a grand tale of mankind achieving what it needs to achieve. So, for example, like you say, the Second World War. The Second World War, from a religious historical perspective would view that as a necessary as, as horrific as it was it was a necessary clash between good and evil right in this case almost everyone universally views this as ace of and right. ace of needed to ace of attempts to go for it to project his worldview on the world his nazism and ultimately, it needs to be vanquished and stopped out. Because as it, it does say in the Torah, it, 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 for Esau to go up, it, uh, Jacob has Let's to go, go down. down. War, war by definition, is part of that. Not that we like war, not that we, not that we glorify war, right. but war is episodes when the struggle between nations flash. And as a matter of fact, if, when they flash, one can be extinguished, then we've moved forward until ultimately we can come to the point where there is no war. But you can't come to the point where there is no war without fighting wars. That's a good point. Obviously, you don't have a, a Facebook account like I do because people, I, mean, I, I was just reading, it was actually a friend of mine, this woman was talking about the conflict saying, well, you know, it's the, the, the Jews are wrong. Everybody's just got to get along. God really just wants people to love each other and be happy and whatever. And there's... And anybody else who, who attacks is wrong. Right. So, you know, if you think about it, the, what, is, what is really the sticking point? What is preventing that from happening? What is preventing that from happening? Is it, is it the Jews? Is the Jews preventing that from happening? Then why were the Arabs rioting and massacring people in 1929? That's a good point. So what was the issue then? Because the country was controlled by the British. Right. The right. Jews didn't control anything. So if it wasn't for the fact that there is an antipathy between the groups, and the antipathy is that one group rep has one representation, mm -hmm. what it represents, and the other group has the other representation. Right. Now, I must admit that confusing all of this, making the whole thing even more confusing, right. is the fact that oftentimes the Jews don't have their act together. And not right. every Muslim is a Yishmaelite. And, you know, not every uh, Western uh, citizen of the Holy Roman Empire, which became the West, is an Asavite. So what you have is you got a lot of people, Jews and non-Jews alike, that are, come on, can't we all get together? You know, let's hold hands, we'll get together, we can find accommodation with each other and all that. And then amongst them are these people that have this religious view. Well, then the question would be, and again, those that have the religious view, um, Obviously, when you, if, if you're, you're having a discussion with somebody on an airplane about the crisis in the Middle East, you're discussing things from 3,000 years ago. You're discussing religion, you're discussing the land, you're discussing the Torah. Right. Now, most people today, when you're going to get an argument, you know, it'll be a secular argument over what happened in 1967, what happened here. I mean, which is the correct argument here? I mean, which way makes more sense? And obviously, for the side of the Jews, which one makes more sense? Well, listen, the Jews claim to Israel is one of two things. Either A, the Bible says that we that God promised us the land of Israel. Okay? The Bible said that before there was a Quran, before there was a New Testament, the 
The Bible said that clearly. If you view yourself as a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you have been given uh, the claim to the land and your aspiration in life, wherever you are, no matter what happens to you, is to go back to that land. That's one approach. The other approach is that we were a bunch of people, we were wandering around the world, and everyone treated us so poorly that we deserve a land of our own. Right, which is And that we argument. decided that we're going to pick the place in the Middle East to make that land our own, and we decided to go back there and lay claim to it. Now, there are Arabs that could say, well, we got there first. Why did you have to lay claim? It's a pretty strange place to make lay a claim. Why don't you lay a claim to Southern California? Why did you lay claim to this piece of the Middle East? Arabs, 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 Arabs. And you got to plunk yourself down right smack in the middle of that? I mean, do what, uh, what's her name said? Helen Thomas, you know? Uh, Go back to Poland, Poland where you came from. Poland makes more sense, right. Back to Poland. You know, and you know, the truth is sometimes you wonder. So the Jews said, well, we actually tried to do Poland, but it they kicked us out. So well, right? Right. And we tried to do Germany, they kicked us out. We tried to do Spain, we tried to do France. We tried to do a lot of places, you know, but they kicked us out. So really, you could think about it, though. And if I was an Arab, I might say, you know, tough break. But that doesn't mean that you got to come to my neighborhood. Right. Understand like if a guy that. comes up to my door and he's, you know, looking pretty ragged and he's homeless, and he knocks on the door and he says, I'm homeless. I have to live in your house. So I say, I understand you're homeless. I feel really, really bad for you. But... I don't want you living in my house. I can understand that. So to me, um, the biblical claim is the only claim. Now, I know, you know many of my co-religionists and my fellow Jews are just going bonkers to hear a Jew say something like this. But without the biblical claim, it's, it's, it's iffy. It's iffy. I can understand. Maybe the Israelis got a good claim. Their claim is everyone kicked us out from everyone else, so therefore we have to go well, there. Well, they got other claims too, back from the Balfour Declaration, back into the 20s. And, why? You know, well, but why there? The only reason you go back to the 20s is because he says, look, the Tsar is treating us like dirt. Everyone else is treating right. us like dirt. We got to go somewhere. The only place we want to go, we want to go to Israel. Then they offered him Uganda. They said, no, Uganda won't work. I guarantee you, if they'd gone to Uganda, things would have been much better off. First of all, they would have greatly improved the whole state of, of uh, the whole continent of Africa. Africa. That's probably true. And I think a lot of those Africans would have been pretty happy to have all those Jews move over there. Probably would have been. Especially to Uganda, you know. Maybe. I don't know. We yeah. don't know how it would have turned out. Yeah, it might have turned out the same, but you never know. <laughs> might have turned out. Right. You never know. Right. But the fact that everyone's giving you a hard time does not mean that you have to live in my house. No, I understand that. But then the question is, was it really their house? Right. But not just biblically, but, you know, it's also... But if I'm living here now, you know, Walmart, Walmart says, listen, they wouldn't let us build a store there, and they wouldn't let us build a store there, and they wouldn't let us build a store there, so you have to let us build one here. And the people who are living here say, no, you don't have to come here either. Just go... So Walmart says, well, then where are we going to build a store? And the people say, that's not our problem. And that's what I think the people could say to the Jews. Jews say, well, where are we going to live? That's not our problem. Just go away. Now, of course, if it come with a biblical perspective, so sorry, guys. We were here before you. God promised it. That's why we came back to this. Of all the places in the world, why did they choose that little strip of land on the Mediterranean? Well, that's the reason. And the thing about it is, obviously, is because the argument will be iffy, the, the religious argument, if the other players in that uh, argument can agree with it. I mean, they, they, they come from the same book. I mean, they, right. they read the same story, they understand, and they're not arguing that. Right. They don't argue against it. Now, maybe in, you know, California or in Colorado or somewhere, they might be arguing the religious argument doesn't matter, but in the Middle East, right. the, religious argument, the religious argument does matter. The Christians for sure get it, yep. and the truth is, even the Arabs get it. The Arabs get it. They it's get great, it. Right. It's their book, right. too. Right, and they know why there's a fight. They know why there's a fight, because they get it, and as Ishmael's children, they understand what's going on. They get a different version of the fight, but they also get it according to their version. So if we, the fact that we are living in that strip of land in the Middle East shows that everyone recognizes that this is a biblical issue. 
Right, right, which is true. So even the liberals, even people say Israel's wrong, you know, it's true, Israel's wrong. We're not able to, on their level, convince them. And as a matter of fact, I would think that the rest of the world would say, listen, guys, just pack up and go to Southern California. You know, just move over there and do it. And if you you're know. secular, that would be, that would be a, a sensible argument. Right. Why do you have to have Israel? It makes everything so upsetting. Like, just pack out of there. But the people that recognize that when it came time for the Jews to go somewhere, they went to Israel, it's because it's biblical. Otherwise, why specifically go to Israel? So everyone recognizes that what's going on there has a biblical backdrop to it. It is not normal that after having been out of that land for 2,000 years, the people should actually want to go back to that land. It's bizarre. So it's biblical. It's got a biblical backdrop. Well, it was biblical during the Crusades as well. And when the Christians, well, I mean, there was no other reason. Why were they going there? People yeah. from France to be coming down into you know, right. the desert. Right. And why were they fighting with the, with the Arabs? Same reason. Biblical. Right. Right? And why are the Christians still fighting with the Arabs? Same reason. It's also biblical, right? right? right. Though even the West and the Arabs, they, all this is, is a biblical backdrop. And therefore, to try to approach it without recognizing that history and those motivations, and to say, listen, you know, can't we all live together? The truth is, they could easily all live together. They're motivated by different things, though, and therefore, particularly the more militant versions of this, say, you can't all live together. It can't happen. It's really part of a great plan that's being played out by God, and it's got to work its way out. And ultimately, clash and war is part of that. And so if you read like, w the Torah, even coming to the, the time of the Mashiach, is this still part of the same fight? I mean, is this fight supposed to continue even till the end? We know that there is the famous war of Gog right. and Magog. Right. It ends with a war. Now, our vision is that is the war literally to end all wars. Right. Because after that, there will be no war. Mankind will live in peace and harmony. We do look forward to that, but skirting war to get to that does not look like it's ultimately possible. See, that's interesting. And one question I've always had though, at least recently, why biblically do the Arabs are making some claim to Jerusalem? What is their claim to Jerusalem even biblically? Because that, that's the one I don't know. I understand Mecca, I understand you know that, I don't understand why Jerusalem. The side I, we got it, they want it. Right. I, I think, well that's basically it because if they if they don't make a claim to Jerusalem, then the Jews will make a claim to Jerusalem. And then the Jews can say, we were there all these years. This is why they're trying to undermine the Temple Mount and get rid of uh, excavations that really go back to, that show evidence of King Solomon's right. temple and all that. Because they don't want to say that the Jews were there all that time. I mean, because, I mean, which, which I, I do understand that, but Jerusalem itself, and pre-1967, there wasn't too much of a big Arab uproar right. to have Jerusalem. It's really, it's just, it's a maneuver to block the Jews. But ultimately, and it just keeps coming back to this, the very fact that the Jews moved back at this time is because of the biblical roots to the land. Now, the reason the world's having a hard time dealing with this is because there is no parallel in history except for perhaps American Indians, you know, laying claim to like the state of Connecticut or something like that, which no one has given them much credence. No, they're not, that's not working out too well. For no, them. not, right. not going. But there's nowhere else in the world that you find anyone trying to exercise an ancient claim to land. And the world isn't having, having a very hard time with it because the Jews are the only ones. So you think then if a political party in America wanted uh, the U.S. to go back to the 1867 borders, yeah. it would probably be a problem. <laughs> right. Uh, right. So That's that, right. I guess that wouldn't work, wouldn't, work, wouldn't work as well. For some reason, it works for the 1967 borders. That's right. In Israel. That's right. 1867. I'll tell you one thing. They certainly don't want to go back to the 1860. Two borders. No, 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 that, one, <laughs> that one wouldn't work as well either. <laughs> Interesting. So the, so the bottom line here is listen, the, the, the arguments, which will have the secular arguments back and forth, they can go one way, they can go the other way. But the one thing that actually all sides, the real sides in this real dispute should agree to, because we're all talking about a religious argument, 
is the biblical is the whole biblical argument to begin with because certainly the Jews certainly the Christians and certainly the, the uh, uh, people of Islam do agree with that argument back then so it's right. like uh, that's probably what we should be talking about now the people that really need to get to get attuned to that are ultimately the Jews because there are many Jews oh, in yeah. Israel and certainly abroad but in Israel in positions of leadership that don't necessarily get it. I believe that the current Prime Minister of Israel does get it. He is a Likud person. He's a you know, disciple of the, ben, uh, the, um, the Begin approach. And you know, Begin came to the UN and he said, you know, when he wanted to speak about Israel, he right away starts talking about the Bible and hearkening right. back to the Bible. That's how he understood who we are and what we are. It's in that context, and only in that context, that ultimately Israel has a claim. However, by the same token, in that context, it does mean that there's going to have to be struggle and strife, because by the same token, if we go back to that biblical claim, the biblical claim brings with it Ishmael right. and Esau and all the struggle that has to do with them. So there's going to be a fight, and it's going to be a long fight, and that's the only way this thing's going to be worked out. Right. Wow. But ultimately, we believe it will be good, right. and there will be an ultimate peace. Huh? The war to end all wars will come, and then there won't be any wars after that, which is good. Which is a good thing. And one last thing that always confuses me, this is a side note, totally. You notice maybe there's a problem with some of the, the, the construction and the building people in, in Arab countries. You notice they, for some reason, and this is probably just they need to go to architecture school in America, every time they build a mosque or a hospital or playground, they build it right on top of a missile launch base. Yeah. So I was just wondering, maybe that's just a side it's, note. It's, it's a maybe in the architectural schools in Arab countries, they should mention maybe moving the missile launching sites from the no, mosques. They got the idea from the United States because, you know, there's all these mixed-use developments. Mixed use I never right. thought of that. Okay. And that's the way to do it. You know, that's like, why you're the rabbi and I'm just Jeff. To bring it all together. Mixed-use developments <laughs> is like all the rage now, you know? It is, makes sense. It always builds your playgrounds with a missile launcher. Right. I mean, right. you know, anyway, the missile launchers are used so rarely, right. you may as well have a playground on top uh, of I it. totally agree. I guess I can't argue. All right. That's a good one. All right. Well, you can, we, we change things around a little bit. If you want to watch this show and every other show that we've had in the past, if you go to Facebook, we're going to put up a link on Facebook where, on YouTube, you can find all our old shows. So give wow. us about a half hour to put that up there. And you can watch all the great shows because, you know, Pass them around to your friends and buddies. That's cool. You maybe even buy some Jeff and the Rabbi lore. You know? Yeah. Can have them. All right, great. That's well, right. I guess we will see you next week. Are they selling Jeff wigs on there? Absolutely. Jeff wigs a big seller, by the way. See you next week.